So you're going to receive power. How many have received the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? How many want more? Yeah. Is there a limit to how much power? No. What limits it? How do we limit it? Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, unbelieving, right? That's a force in and of itself. There's a, there's a strength to unbelief that stopped Jesus from doing miracles. The Bible says he could do no miracles in his hometown because of their unbelief. Like, this is who created the universe. And the stronghold was so big in that town because they were familiar with him and they looked right past what they thought they knew. So can we just have one of those Selah moments and ask the Lord to awaken our spirits so we don't walk right past him when he's in our midst, but we don't expect him to come a certain way, so we miss him right when he's walking right among us. It's such a, a confounding thing. Now, in retrospect, we're looking back after all these years and to see the Pharisees constantly missing the fact that God was in their midst because he didn't fit in their box. And that's a warning for us today that we're going to talk about tonight. But I, I wanted to just give you a little history of Ken Fish and, and what we're part of and what we've been part of really for decades. Thank God. I, you know, I don't know how my life would have been different if I hadn't been. I don't want to think about that. So I just want to weave in a few things. This is the verse. Um, I'm just going to expand a little bit on Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. It's in the voice. It says, the Father on his own authority has determined the ages and the epochs, right, the eons, the epochs of history, but you haven't been given this knowledge. Here's the knowledge you need. How many need more knowledge? <laughs> Here's what we need, that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, all right? He was telling us this is going to be a game changer. You don't have to be a Ph.D., Right, And I've joked about it in the past. I don't want to make fun of anybody because I have degrees in college and all. But when you go for your master's degree in theology, it's an MDiv, Master's of Divinity. And when you go for a doctorate degree, it's called a D-min. And if you say that fast, it sounds like demon. So be careful. <laughs> be careful they don't get so educated that you get demons because you, for, you can't have any faith anymore, right? This is only knowledge you need. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. And when that comes on you, you get power and includes power over your own flesh and your own kind of random thoughts that always want to take you away from the things of the Lord. And, you know, we have to crucify that part of our flesh. We just have to let that die and trust for the, our own resurrection inside of us into that new image of God. And then it says, you will be my witnesses. And how many have looked at this verse before, right? Like when you were being trained in evangelism and you were taught to take your tracks and go out into the park and, and talk to people about the Lord, you'll be my witnesses. But it's bigger than that. It's a much bigger word, actually, than just actually witnessing to somebody. It's also the way you live your life will be a witness to the Lord. And when there's power that's from above and not just the earthly self-control and self-will and your own doing, your own energy. When it's Holy Spirit energy, that will be a witness to people. They'll recognize there's something different about you. You don't handle yourself the same way other people on your job do. You have more patience. You're willing to apologize. You're a better listener. There's a million ways that all of the effects of Spirit of God being in us in com combination with the Word of God and the wisdom that comes and the humility that comes. How many have been humbled since you've been a born-again Christian filled with the Spirit? Right? You, get, you come down off of that high horse a little and you stop thinking more highly of yourself than you ought and you start realizing how often you've been making mistakes and people have been cutting you some slack, especially the Lord. But it's like, no, I, if I'm going to do this, I want to be the closest image of you as I can be. And if there's anything in me that's stopping that from happening, I want to recognize it, become spiritually alert and aware, and I want to be a witness beyond my words. I want my life to be a witness for you. And it says, first in Jerusalem, then beyond Judea, to Judea, Samaria, and finally to the farthest places on the earth. And that's exactly what's happened. All right? And there's some really inspiring people in our culture. If you know anything about the Hobby Lobby family, their last name is the Green family. I happened to meet some of them, and their lawyer... Uh, one of their lawyers that helped them is a guy named Bill High. And, and one of the senior members of the family, like the patriarch of the family, said, wouldn't it just be like God to give me a lawyer whose name is Bill High? Because <laughs> he's always sending me a high bill, you know. 
but like they're super humble people. They started in their garage. I mean, really, it's impossible and unnatural to think that they would have the size of, uh, of, of, of the wealth they have, but also that they were the ones that funded the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C. If you haven't gone down there and see it, put it, make it on your bucket list. It's an amazing place. And that's just one little piece of what they did. And, and they're just so careful to remember and to remind the next generation there's only one reason that we have this wealth. It's because the Lord blessed our business. And, and they're not confused about that. They remained humble in the midst of the billions of dollars that their business is worth. They give so much money away. And they went all the way up to the Supreme Court, right, in that, in that health care case. And, and they had favor there, too. It's just amazing how the Lord will bless your way when you, when you put him first. And they made him the CEO of their company. And they put, made him the chairman of the board, literally. And look at what happened. Amazing. And it doesn't have to be billions. It just has to be our heart. All right, so you're going to be my witnesses by the way you live. And Jesus said, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit, and a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. But how many know you're producing fruit one way or another? Every day you're alive, you're producing fruit, and you have to determine whether you can increase the quality of the fruit. And the answer is yes, you can. Not because you're working and striving at it. Often it's just letting go of things as opposed to striving. And that becomes a witness to the Lord, that you're not stressed out the way other people are stressed out. And lots of examples in the culture we could talk about, right? So I know it's a little bit hard to see this, but um, I just wanted you to see that there's other definitions of the word witness. And, and the first one says, in the legal sense, is if you're on a, on a stand in a courtroom. And then B says, a historical sense, somebody who saw something happen. Uh, I met the man who who was on the, the platform and Martin Luther King gave his speech that everybody considers the greatest speech of all time, the I have a dream speech, right? And he had just been there as a college kid and they needed more help for security. He was a big guy, he was an athlete. And he happened to be right on the platform, right behind where Martin Luther King was giving that talk. And ironically, he, he heard, <laughs> I mean, you may or may not know this, but the I have a dream part wasn't in the notes of that speech that day. So there was a gospel singer, and I'm blanking on her name. Can you? Mahalia Jackson was there, and she had been with him. And in the middle of a speech, she goes, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. And if you listen closely, you could hear her. And he doesn't even, like, pause. He just shifts right into the I have a dream part, right? So he was a witness of that. And nobody could tell him otherwise. And he's got the proof because he asked Martin Luther King, can I have your notes? And he still has them. And they're worth a lot of money now, but he's not getting rid of them, right? It's just a brilliant thing that Martin Luther King, with all his Ph.D. brilliance, and he really was a brilliant man, he was still open enough to the Holy Spirit to go with the flow. And we didn't even know. He walked from that platform to the White House and met John F. Kennedy and John F. Kennedy said, oh, I saw your I have a dream speech. <laughs> right? It wasn't even in the notes. And that's the most famous speech ever. Why? Because the Spirit of God was in there. And he was open enough to be a witness in that moment. So that man, I can't remember his name right now, but that man has the notes. He was a witness of it. And then this is the hard one for us. And, and uh, the third point is it's also in an ethical sense that we're a witness those who, after his example, have proved the strength and genuineness of their faith in Christ by undergoing a violent death. Ah! Can't you go faster and skip this part? But uh, why else would he say, I want you to take up your cross daily and follow me if this wasn't going to be a part of our walk? It doesn't mean literal death, of course, but it means that, that there's always something else that we can chip off the rock here and become more like him. And we don't really like that part. We'd, we'd rather not have to deal with that. But we end up hindering ourselves if we're afraid of that because it's so great to be free of something. And, and once you've been free of something, you never want to go back to that bondage again. And if you could be free of one thing, then you could be free of other things too. And it takes courage to do that because you're often facing some really difficult memories or feelings or just bad things that have happened to us. And it's hard to do this, but, oh, the reward of being obedient to the Lord. And this word martyr, actually you could see it right up at the top there in Greek, it's martus, right? So that's not just a witness where you're handing tracts out to people in the park. You should do that. That's great. But this is also saying, I'm willing to lay my life down for the cause of Christ. And there's nothing convenient about that, is there? 
right? A lot of it, that doesn't mean he doesn't want us to be blessed and benefit us, but Jesus said, my food, I get nutrition by doing the will of the one who sent me, right? I can even skip a meal because when I'm doing what he asked me to do, I get nourishment from that. I don't want to get there. And this is one of the times in the King James Version where that book, where the word witness is used as martyr it's in Acts 22:20, 20, when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by, that's Paul talking, and consenting unto his death. When the blood of the witness Stephen, and I think it marked Paul, I think he couldn't forget that. And if you've ever read The Cross of the Switchbleed, bleed, <laughs> Switchblade, that's kind of a Freudian, right? And you heard Nikki Cruz's story. David Wilkerson was so courageous, he was witnessing to the gang members in New York City. He was really like a country bumpkin from out in Pennsylvania. He saw the cover of a Life magazine, and he decides, I'm going to go to New York and find these guys, and I'm going to witness to them. <laughs> he had no idea what he was doing, right? And, and he gets there, and he's, and he's witnessing to, to Nikki Cruz, and Nikki Cruz said, I'm going to cut you in a thousand pieces. And... And David Wilkerson, that's okay. He said, all thousand pieces will say, Jesus loves you, Nikki. Jesus loves you, Nikki. And then when he's home, he's trying to go to sleep, and all he could see is a thousand pieces of a guy all cut up, all saying, Jesus loves you, Nikki. Jesus. And he goes back, and he says, make it stop. <laughs> and he ended up becoming this amazing evangelist. Goes all over the world. Because one country bumpkin who's not, he, I was a brilliant man, right? But he didn't know what he was doing. He had no clue what he was doing when he was wandering around New York. It didn't matter. God was with him. He was a witness, even in his bumpkinness. Because people see you don't have any qualities that would qualify you in the world sense. It's got to be God. I love that. He takes the foolish things of the world. Here's a couple more times that it's used in this way. And it's in the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Thou holdest fast my name. And I'm using King James because that's the time when you see it as martyr. You hold fast my name, and you haven't denied my faith. Even in those days when my, when in, wherein, sorry, Antipas was my faithful martyr. A faithful martyr. And look, let's just not get so technical for a minute. How many of you have given up things that you could have done, but because you were a Christian, you had a conviction, and you said, no, I'm going to let that thing go? Come on, if that's you. A lot of us have done that, right? That's a form of martyrdom. That's not because you want to be seen as some great hero. It's like, no. I'm, I'm following Jesus, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Right? The cross before me, I'm leaving the world behind me, not turning back. Best decision you can make. That's a form of martyrdom right there. That's a form of a witness. This man, Antipas, was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. And then another one is Revelation 17, 6, where it says, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus, with the blood of the martyrs, right? And when we love our lives, not unto death, and I think this is a misquoted scripture often in Revelation. It says, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. The accuser of the brethren is cast down. Somebody should say amen about that one. Is that true? And which accused them before God day and night, and they overcame him, the accuser of the brethren. How? You know it. By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. Don't stop there. Please, okay? Don't stop there. I know there's a cold in there. And you could say, well, that ends it. And they love not their lives unto death. So when you quote this verse, say they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and their willingness to be martyrs for the Lord. I've already given up my life for him. I've already made the decision that I'm not going back. And if the pressure comes in, okay, I'll get stronger through the pressure because I'm not alone. He's going to support me in this. And sometimes you look a little foolish, don't you? And we don't really like looking foolish to other people. We like acceptance. We're taught that in school. We don't want to raise our hand off it in classroom because what if we give the wrong answer and people laugh at us, right? So you hear a teacher ask an open-ended question and nobody wants to raise their hand. Except me. I was always raising my hand. <laughs> so I love this. It's commentary from the voice translation. It says, God took the first step to rescue us from the corrupt world. He granted us his power, revealed to us Sorry, yeah, true knowledge. He granted us his power, revealed to us true knowledge, and then he spoke 
spoken to us great promises, okay? So th I want you to expand a little bit like we expand in the idea of a witness, expand what power is, right? Because we know that they did miracles and they saw people just miraculously healed. The man that was begging on the way into the temple, he gets up and he's jumping around. That's a power ministry to see healing like that, right? But what, uh, what about somebody who gets off of heroin? <laughs> That's a miracle too, and then you have this sustaining power and you never go back to that thing anymore. And it's not because you're so strong that you want to, but you're just not. That's called willpower. That's a supernatural power abiding in you to give you strength to do something you couldn't do in the natural. Also called grace. And he's done all of this that we might participate in his own nature and reflect his life. So Lord, help us to receive your nature. Holy Spirit, reveal the nature of God to us and how we can change to be more like Jesus. How we can yield ourselves more to you every day in all of our relationships, in everybody that we talk to, that we hold in high esteem what you hold in high esteem. And we know that means unbelievers because it says he wants not one person to perish. We are not passive observers of God's mission. Looking at some of you, I think you're about to fall asleep. So can we say this out loud together? We are not passive observers of God's mission. What are we? We must receive his grace, grow in knowledge, and join him in the work of redemption. That, that takes power, okay? So why am I saying this when this weekend is coming up? Because we expect to see a demonstration of God's power to heal people on Saturday. And however else God is going to choose to move. Because we know this man can fish and he operates in that because he's been a fool for Christ. He didn't care what people thought. He stepped out and he gave prophetic words on when he wasn't exactly sure what was going to happen. And he prayed for people. And after you do that enough, you develop a, an abandon, a, a reckless abandon for God to say, you know what, I don't care if people think I look foolish to do this. If somebody gets healed or delivered or saved, that's worth all the foolishness in the world. Because my reputation means nothing. I died to that old reputation. I'm now identifying with you, Lord. And you've got to be willing to, to just pray for people even if nothing happens. Even if you don't see an immediate response. That's not what it's about. It's having the faith to lay hands on the sick like he told us to do. Amen? So I just quoted this because it's a good reminder for me. And I didn't quote the whole thing, but prior to this, he goes through that formula. He says, add to your faith virtue, add to your virtue knowledge, knowledge discipline. And there's several more, and it ends in love, right? And he says, if you do that, if you work this algorithm that God gave us to die to our flesh, take on the nature of Christ, take on that divine nature, if you do this, how about that? Then you will never fail along the way. How many want that one? Right? Wow, I could build up my immune system that if I operate in the disciplined spirit of the Lord and I yield myself to him, I'll never fall along the way. And this is a man who fell, isn't it? Right? Peter, he knows what it's like to, to fall short. You can be sure that you'll be richly welcomed into the eternal kingdom of our Lord. That is why I keep reminding you of these things, even though you believe them and have made these truths a part of your lives. I know Easter, um, we attended Faith Fellowship for a long time, and Pastor Damola used to say all the time, I know you've read this in your Bible, but I'm going to remind you again. I'm going to remind you of the word again. You've got to burn it in. It doesn't matter if you've heard it. it. Hearing it again brings more life, brings more nutrition, builds your faith, pushes away the other thoughts that are trying to creep in there, and, and removes the distractions. Memorize scripture. Focus on the word. That's like food. Eat the Bible, right? Eat it. Just eat the scroll. And you've made this a part of your life as long as I draw breath and I know it's right for me to keep stirring you up with these reminders. And that's our job to each other. That's why community is so powerful. And that's why being in a negative community is also powerful the wrong way. Because if you're around a bunch of people who don't believe, that can pull you down. So you're either going to pull them up or they're going to pull you down. There's no neutral ground in the middle. All right, so let's just think about our history, Tricia and I. It's a, it's, a, it's a small little focus, but because of what Ken Fish is going to be doing this weekend, I want you to tie in with Peter Wagner and John Wimber. This is back in the 80s uh, when they were together. Peter was a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, and he hired John Wimber to help him out with the, the school of, of world evangelism because John Wimber was very gifted as an evangelist. And he wrote a book called Power Evangelism. And what did we start with tonight? You will receive 
when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and the revelation, and it says right over on the top of it, if you can't read it, but I wrote it up there. He sold over a million copies of this book, and for a Christian book, that's a little unusual. All right, that, that means there was some truth in there that kept resonating with people as long ago as this was written. We're going to still read it in our men's group after we're finished with the book we're reading on. That's going to be the next book because it still applies. It's the truth. He got this download of revelation, and it wasn't just evangelism of convincing someone in an argument to say, you know, you're going to go to hell. If you don't accept Jesus, you better say yes so you don't go to hell. It was like he'd be out on the streets, and he'd start prophesying and praying over people, and miracles would happen in the streets, and people were drawn to what happened. They knew there was something real about it. And shame on the church that that became, that we became that passive spectator group. And, and what they told him when he first got saved was he was reading the New Testament. He's like, well, when do we get to do the stuff? When do we get to go out and pray for the sick? And, and, and they, they said to him, well, we don't actually do it. We just talk about it. And he said, I gave up drugs for that. <laughs> he was one of those guys that was doing drugs. So People that you would know, Cheon and Ken Fish too, but we could say many more, they were in that class. When they were teaching this class at, at Fuller, Cheon was a student, Ken Fish was a student, and then Ken also became the teaching assistant, a TA, so that he was now helping lead the class. So for years he was in there watching what was happening. It was called MC 510 at Fuller, and really you could argue that it's it's the 29th chapter of Acts that all of us should be challenged to be living in on a daily basis, right? Because 28th chapter is the last one in the Bible, but the Holy Spirit kept on moving, the church kept on growing, so we should know that our life, when I wake up tomorrow, it's Acts chapter 29, verse 1. <laughs> and this is what he said, because he was, he was raised initially when he got saved. It was a very conservative church that didn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. So he said he was just going out, and as he was witnessing to people, and in some instances I received remarkable insights. We would call that a word of knowledge or a prophetic word about somebody. For example, knowledge of a specific serious sin or a deep hurt. So one time he was on a plane, he looked across the aisle, and he saw the, the name of a woman written across a man's forehead. Like, really? Somebody spike your drink or what? And he had become very comfortable with the gift by that point, and he said, what does the mean Rachel? Let's just say it was Rachel, I don't know. What does that mean to you? And the guy just like, really, like that rocked him because that was the girl he was having an affair with, and his wife was sitting right next to him on the plane. <laughs> so it was one of those planes back in the old days where you could go upstairs to the lounge. Like, I think that was a 747. And the guy said, I need to talk to you. And he gets upstairs and he says, how did you know that name? He said, I didn't know it. God told me. <laughs> right? Well, okay, that's a whole other thing right there. So the guy starts crying and, 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 and he repents because he knows that, you know, Jehovah, sneaky, put a guy next to him on the plane to reveal something he had to deal with. And, and then he goes to John Wimber, what do I do? He said, well, you're going to have to go down and, and repent to your wife and tell her that you did this. And then he does. And, and then the wife is looking over at John Wimber across the aisle like, who is this guy? He told you what? And, and then they got saved because it was a demonstration of power. See, like, why would that be different? Is God a, a respecter of person? Does he favor you over somebody else or somebody else over you? No, but these were people that were willing to be foolish enough to be wrong sometimes because when you're right, it changes people's lives. And it, it's just a better way to live that you're pushing the boundaries of what you think you can do because God wants you to step into your full calling, right? So he was getting these pictures of people, remarkable insights into an unbeliever's life, specific serious sin or a deep hurt. And he says, I experienced what seemed to be a supernatural force flowing through me that drew people to God as I shared the gospel with them. When I described his experience to the colleagues of the people that he was in that church with that taught against the Holy Spirit, they advised me not to talk about these experiences. <laughs> so what is it about us? When we've never done it a certain way, we automatically assume there must be something wrong with it. And I'm not saying don't be careful about your doctrine. You do need to be really careful about your doctrine. Be the Bereans. But if it says let all things be done decently and in order, that means let all things be done. And if you read it in the Bible, it's still happening. If it's not happening to me, I can't say, well, it just doesn't happen anymore. I'm just not pressing in for what, what I'm reading about. And that gets a little convicting. 
He said, my colleagues were uncomfortable with this whole idea, and so was I. They were concerned that I would lose stature if other leaders heard about it. What? Yes, like you're going to be labeled as demonic. They had no explanation for what had happened. But they were reading their Bibles. They just had believed that that doesn't happen anymore. But anybody who reads the Bible sees that it's all over the New Testament, that this is what's supposed to be happening. We're supposed to be walking in that kind of power that the gifts of the Spirit are operating in us, and we have to exercise those muscles in order for them to, to become strengthened. And if we're always afraid of what if it doesn't work, what if it goes wrong, man, stop with all that confusion and just step out in faith and try it. So Peter Wagner, who is also raised in that, uh, so they call it cessationism, that the works of the Holy Spirit ceased, and, and I'm a cessationist if I don't believe that that Holy Spirit still operates anymore, which was birthed at Princeton University, not far from here, um, and we, we need to repent for that. So this was a different kind of power in Peter Wagner's life. It says, he went through paradigm shifts. That's what this book is about. This changes everything. A paradigm shift is a radical change in your way of thinking. He went under, he talks about in this book 17 different times that he had a paradigm shift in the Lord. Each chapter is about a way that he was wrong about God and that he repented of it and had to go back and change the chapters in the books that he wrote because he, he was honest enough to say, you know what, I just, I, I believed a bad doctrine. I believe the works of the Holy Spirit stopped. And, and he was a real, like, well-known scholar at that point, and his whole reputation was being put on the line, and he didn't care, right? The cross before me, the world behind me. If they don't like it, if they don't like me at Fuller, I'm, I'm willing to get fired over this. And, and he says, in, you know, in the introduction to the book, this man saying, come on this journey with me. I was locked into a religious structure in my mind, but I allowed the Lord to work on me. And, and there was probably more than 17, but there were 17 chapters about all the ways the Lord showed him to fine tune his thinking. So I just want to do a clip of, a, of an interview I did with Ken Fish. Those of you that haven't seen him before might not know much about him. But this is talking about those days at Fuller when Ken Fish was the teaching assistant. And let's just watch it real quick. Can you put it up there, Ray? back again in 83, and that was the end of it. And was the class still going on, the MC 510 at that time? Yeah, it was. I took the, I took the MC 510 class that John Wimber was teaching at Fuller Seminary. Um, he was the uh, adjunct professor, Peter Wagner. C. Peter Wagner was the faculty member of record. Um, and once I'd taken the class, I actually became John Wimber's TA, and I you know, sat in all the lectures, graded papers, interacted with students. Around. Doris Wagner tells me she would have to take attendance on the way in because people were trying to sneak in the class who hadn't paid for the credits because they wanted to see the miracles that were happening. And That's right. when do you hear about that? Nobody's usually trying to sneak into a class. They're trying to usually cut class. But uh, exactly I guess right. it was, the thing was Peter knew the theology, but John wanted to do, he wanted to demonstrate what was going on, not just talk about it. That's correct. Um, and then of course came cl clinic time as we called it. And the whole point was to demonstrate the very things we'd been talking about. And so, you know, right there in the room, people would get various kinds of healings or deliverance or whatever and these it was. Were, these were students getting a PhD, many of which had been out on the mission field and had never heard that a Christian could need deliverance. That's am, right. am I right? So That's correct. talk about shifting your worldview and a paradigm shift on the oh, fly. Yeah. They're watching their co-students making noises that they never would have thought, like something from the Exorcist movie uh, in their minds. And yet, you know, the school isn't even teaching that this should be happening today. So that created another whole problem, right? Well, that's right, because all of this was being done, as I said, under the auspices of C. Peter Wagner. And he was a professor in the, what, was one, what was at that time called the School of World Mission, or SWIM, S-W-M, School of World Mission. But John Wimber was by far the, the most adept of the practitioners. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, the MC 510 class got underway. And that was just its course designator. It was a course on church growth, M for mission, C for church growth, 510 because it was a graduate level course. Um, and you know, so we met once a week in the evenings. And uh, John would lecture, and then we'd do clinic. And sometimes we'd get out of there pretty late. The real animus came from the School of Theology, SOT as they called it. Right. But but there was also pushback from the School of Psychology or the SOP. Right. And 
I think that these two sort of linked arms and they exerted their combined will and effectively got the 510 class, MC 510 class, shut down and driven from campus. And it wasn't real long after that. It wasn't immediate, but maybe it was three years or four years later. He did, just said, you know, I'd, I've had enough. And he left and started the Wagner uh, right. stuff that he was doing in Colorado. But it's so ironic how circular it is, because you read the New Testament, the Pharisees couldn't understand what Jesus was doing. Instead of just accepting the miracles and realizing they had to shift their worldview, they want to kill him. You know, and here's yeah. the school of theology. It's happening right in their midst. And the only thing they can do is blame it on the devil. Meanwhile, people are getting healed. And they, can't, they have to ignore it and shut it down. And... Boy, if that's not something we're going to be accountable for when we get to the, to the throne. And, and here he's like, I'm demonstrating it right in your midst, and you still can't accept it, and you have to shut it down. It's a real religious it, mindset. It was really amazing because, I mean, not all of the healings were what I would call blockbuster healings. They never are that way. I mean, there's some that are, but others are of a lesser sort. They're important to the person who got healed, for sure, but, but they just don't have that wow factor. Um, but there were some really... I mean, truly amazing healings that happened in those classes while they were going on. And, you know, John taught that class for, I can't remember now, but I think it was five years. And, um, you know, there were just, there were amazing things. People with legs that were like this much too short, the leg would grow out and be healed. People who had cancer who got healed, blind people who got healed. I mean, there was no denying what was going on and it was creating this stir. And it was so much of a thing that, I don't know where it is, but somewhere in my files someplace, I have a, an old magazine from Christian life and it had a light blue cover and it was talking about signs and wonders in the seminary and man this just made them all kinds of cranky so you know in the in the school of theology and the school of uh, psychology and so it just had to go it didn't fit a lot of people's cessationist theology that they held and that you know they'd gotten it wherever they'd gotten it um and in some ways I think it it was I think in some ways all of this was serving to upstage maybe the preeminence of the theological faculty. And so with that, there was also a, I mean, I don't think anybody ever explicitly said this, but I, I mean, you could see what was happening. There was a sense of we need to protect our turf. This is making us look bad. Still hard for me to listen to that. Let's say the very thing we're pressing in for, God shows up, and they shut it down. Like you're reading about it in the Bible. You never saw it. Now you're seeing it, and you can't get behind it because it's going to make us look bad? Really? It's about you and how you look? So people are going to keep their devils and stay crippled? And please forgive us, Lord, for being that strict and structured and religious. That's a wicked spirit that we're worried about our own reputation and people are getting healed and it's making us look bad. We gotta shut it down. God forgive us. So this was a book that Peter Wagner uh, edited but he had held this big conference that was called a Symposium on Power Evangelism held at Fuller in 1988. It didn't come out until 2012. Destiny Image thought it would be a good idea to publish it, and I agree. One of the chapters is called In Dark Dungeons of Collective Captivity. Okay, and it was, it was written by one of these missionaries at the Fuller School who was actually out among what we call like a tribal uh, uh, group of people in the jungles of, I think it was South America. And, you know, they were very much into like deep kind of spiritism and, and things that I'm no expert on, but... Like, they had never had any exposure to anybody from the Western world. And he learned their language, and he got in, involved in their culture. And as I was reading this chapter, first of all, collective captivity just really stuck with me right there, right? Because so much of what we went through in the last two years felt like that. Felt like people were just repeating lines that somebody else had told them. But you could also think about, in, you know, no... I don't mean any insults to anybody, but what happened in World War II in Germany with, with the people that had to look the other way, right? Because they were so they were caught in a bad spot if you were a German. Even if you didn't agree with what was going on, what were you going to do about it? How could you stop it? So you, you get this collective captivity, or you're in a family and some bad things are going on, but you, you kind of have to look the other way. And now you're captive to this spirit that nobody's talking about, but you know it's there. 
And we got to be really careful of that because we're here to be a difference maker against that kind of a force when it's based on lies. We could have collective grace. We could have a collective immunity with each other. We could be in, we could be in the truth together collectively and, and lift each other's faith. And people that, you know, John and Cheryl Price worked for Benny Hinn for a long time, and, and they would talk about how so many people had come so far to go to those meetings. The, the collective faith in the room was so strong for miracles that that actually helped the momentum for the miracles to happen. And I completely agree with that. So it's collective faith has power too. And it's why we need each other. It's why we're not islands and we need to physically be together to see that happen. So well, I just want to talk a little bit about this because this particular author of this chapter put together a chart that I really like and I've been using it since I, I read it and trying to apply it to different things so maybe it'll help you. This is what he wrote. Demonization is the imposition of an evil spirit into the life of a human being. You've got somebody on the front row here that's taught multiple classes on this, and you can go back on our YouTube channel and you can find hours and hours of teaching about deliverance and all the different ways that people get demonized and then also how we get them free. And that's the only option is to get them free, <laughs> okay? So the Bible contains numerous accounts of individual demonization, but let's look at some of the features of a society or a subculture where the majority of individuals are demonized. <laughs> Sound like America? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not meaning to make fun of it, but if you don't keep a sense of humor about this stuff, you could get depressed. This will provide us with the background to discuss the concept of collective captivity, the idea that demons working through individuals can control the society to some extent and hinder the gospel. In collective captivity, the gospel arrives and the demonic strategies start to flow with the changing culture. This was written in 1988, okay? So this is before the internet, this is before you know, a lot of what we would understand as regular cultural things like social media. And, and this is when you could watch the news and you weren't hearing the opinion of the person giving the news. <laughs> keep going, keep going, right? Demons seek to gain an increasing influence on the mastery over individuals through attacks on the mind, emotions, and the will. That never changes. The demonic goal is to keep the captives in devil's dark dungeons. And a type of collective captivity that discourages the individual from breaking out into the kingdom of light. Now think about being in Jesus' hometown, and you're thinking, we know who this guy is. He can't be anybody. And everybody else is going, yeah, come on, we know him. We know his family. This is all a big hoax, right? So you, uh, at one point, might have had the faith, but that, that influence of the other people is starting to bring you down. When our sons were in, uh, in, they were in a private school for a while, and we sat through one of these lectures, and the guy said, you know, maybe they were in eighth or ninth grade. You know, it's a very, it's an age when there's a lot of peer pressure that is important to them. And, and I never forgot what this one teacher said. He said, the collective IQ of a group of boys is 10 points lower than the lowest IQ of any one of the people in the group. <laughs> Right, so it's like you're dumbing it down because they're daring you to do things that you wouldn't have done on your own and you're so worried about what everybody else thinks, right? So just think of the opposite. The good news is you're together with a bunch of believers who love the Lord, and if you're not sure about something, their faith is going to help build your faith. And, and that's why we need each other. So it works both ways, not just negative. And, and important to remember what the Bible says, that we're... We are given a covenant between God and the people, a light for the nations, a shining beacon to the world. So we're supposed to be that voice, and as crazy as it's getting out there, there's a stable person in my life that doesn't change their mind with the, with the changing times. Their, their feet are on the rock of Christ, and they're speaking truth. And you need to know what's going on in the culture to know why it's not true, and that's tricky because they'll change definitions to words and, and they'll write scholarly papers that aren't really based on a lot of facts. Another day's topic. You will open blind eyes so they see again. Okay, literally, yes, blind people, eyes are open, but also the revelation of, oh, thank you, you helped me realize I wasn't as confused about my gender as I thought I was. I was just caught up in an echo chamber and a bunch of people were trying to lead me a certain way, but poof, like... The crooked way just got made straight because I met an anointed Christian who spoke the truth in a way that didn't shame me, but just revealed to me that there's a better way than this confusion. 
this is us. This is, this is part of our mission statement, to open blind eyes so they'll see again. And I love this one. You will lead the prisoners blinking out from the caverns of captivity. Now, that doesn't sound like a dungeon. From the cells pitch black with despair. That's our culture today. A new day is dawning. The sunrise from the heavens will break through in our darkness. Say it with me. The sunlight is going to break through in our darkness from the heavens. Thank you, Lord. Do it today. Do it tomorrow. Do it every day that as we're interacting with people, we're, we're on that edge of the prophetic that we can speak into the situation with your words, not my words. I'll open my mouth. You fill it with your words because that's way better than whatever my logic could come up with. So that was the title I told you. Individuals with these societies that live in a kind of collective captivity in which all trans transitions in the life cycle. Warning, America, transitions in the life cycle. Puberty, right? Birth, puberty, marriage, and death are surrounded with evil spiritual rituals. Spirit guides are acquired or inherited at specific stages in the life cycle. Man, if that hasn't been going on. It has been going on, and the church is supposed to be the force that's speaking against that. Somebody's got to speak up and say, no, don't confuse the kids. So this was great. I really like this. I'll, I'll go through it with you in a little bit more detail, but the, the collective captivity cycle, right? So we, we had a similar chart like this in the, in the Sanford's material about performance orientation. I don't know if any of you remember that, but it's like you're at the peak, and then you start losing your confidence and then you start thinking if I perform better I'll get back up there and you hit the peak again and then you, it's empty and the devil just loves keeping us on this merry-go-round right like whoo somebody make it stop so how does it work this way and in the, the, the way this particular author put it he talked about four levels I'm going to start at the bottom at, at six o'clock if it was a regular clock there and what, what's that word can you see it is that for 2022 distraction or what See, people at the restaurant, at all at the table, they all got their heads down in their phones. They're not even having a conversation with their own family members at dinner because they're too distracted. Their phones are just too distracting. And then it goes, we're going to start working now towards 7 o'clock and then 9 o'clock, right? We'll go that way. But before we get there, these are some of the things that he talked about. There's really only three options to leave this collective captivity. I don't like the first one. It's that you die. <laughs> so that means you didn't leave. And then the second one is that you just transfer to a different dungeon. And that's the enemy's plan because the longer he can keep you in this cycle, the less strength, the less immune system you have to that next cycle because you start getting brought along by the energy of the lie of the collective group. Right. 1988 he wrote this. Diminishing returns, and a lot of you know what I'm talking about if you were ever involved with drug use. You start out smoking pot, that's not enough. You start taking pills, that's not enough. You start taking two pills, you take three pills because you build up a certain resistance or, or the, the enemy loves to work on our pride. Oh, you can do three. That guy can only do two, but you can do three. Yeah, don't do that with hits of acid. I could tell you that one. That was a bad, bad mistake. So there's diminishing returns. And if you think of pornography, you'll hear it this way too, right? You, you start by watching, a, looking at a Playboy magazine, but then you, you quickly realize there's more things out there and you go deeper and deeper into the next dungeon because you're not getting the same stimulation you had on the last one. So there's diminishing returns and the satisfaction of the current, I love this, habituated deception. Tell me that's not a great word for today. It's deception, but you've done it so many times you don't even realize. You've habituated this deception into your life, and that fades because you need the next one. So I'm using the example of heroin's not enough anymore, so you got to go to fentanyl, and that's it. That's the last stop on the train. The fentanyl is going to take you out. It didn't just happen overnight. It was a long process that got you there, and that's all these cycles that just keep getting worse. And then the best option, obviously, is you transfer kingdoms. You don't go to another dungeon. You leave the dungeon and you come out of darkness and into the light that Jesus has for us, right? And, and what a shame that the world doesn't think that's an option because they wrote church off. And it's not about church. It's about a relationship with God. And when they see you have a relationship with God, you become a witness because there's power. Get it? So let's start at 1. It says we're at that bottom at 6 o'clock. That's the yellow. The, 
as the old cycle starts to fade, right, you've come back around, and now they've been habituated to, to wanting the next stimulation, right? So the old cycle fades, the demons work on distracting people again through the details of life and the desire for power, acceptance, identity, and prestige. When he wrote this, he didn't know that we were going to care about how many likes we got on social media. He didn't know that the peer pressure that would be, that if you say the wrong thing, you could get canceled, right? So, man, like, whoa, so applicable to what drives people today. I mean, there was always a desire for power and acceptance. But when you confuse people's identity, then they have to look to the counterfeit to keep going. So once that happens, then they get into the deception, which is level two around 8 o'clock, right? And then... It says, when people become dissatisfied with the emptiness of materialism, prestige, power, demons deceive them into believing that spiritual satisfaction can be found again in the newest, latest, and greatest counterfeit. <laughs> right? That's, that's a little editing on my part to get this modern right now with us with the same, same language he was using through a, a stimulation of cults or philosophies. So how many times have you heard people say, oh, I'm spiritual, I'm just not religious? And it could be a lot of other, you know, uh, whatever other types of belief systems there are out there. And ultimately what it is, it's, in my opinion, again, I'm not an expert on it, but it's like, I want to take the good parts of the Bible, but I don't want the bad parts of what they perceive as the bad parts. I don't want any boundaries on my life, but I want to be very spiritual. I'll do mindfulness because that's about prayer and medica med medication, yeah, meditation. But I don't, I don't like the part about crucifying my flesh because I want to sleep with multiple people. I don't want to just have to stay sexually bound and locked into one relationship. Who says I can't just have more? Well, nobody. You can do whatever you want, but it's not good for you. You're, you're, you're missing out on the truth here because you don't understand there's a spiritual transaction. It's not just a physical transaction. And how many people get hung up on, on that? They just don't understand that the distraction goes to deception. And then it becomes dependency. And that's 9 o'clock. Habituated deception leads to dependency. And dependency increases as society. This is He wrote this even in 88. He wrote that the dependency increases as society interacts with newly stimulating technology. And if you saw the movie Social Dilemma, you saw the example of a family that was going through that, that, that awakening where the daughter was drifting further and further away. Or no, I guess she was the stronger one, actually, in that family. Point is, like, the mom didn't have the tools to know how to deal with it because when she grew up, there was nothing like the power of what was going on with social media and how they were actually steering the opinions of people and still are steering the opinions of people. And people told us, well, you should get off of Facebook with your, with your videos. I'm like, well, I mean, really? If there's so much garbage out there, what if we put some truth out there? Let's give people an option to look at something else that's going to be redemptive that can counter the lies that they're hearing, right? And look, you do your own thing. You choose to do whatever conviction you have. But we've got to give them the truth in the midst of the lies, in my opinion. And then there's domination. And that's like being a slave. Okay, you're dominated by something, and you're not in control anymore. And that thing that's dominating you is in control. And that was the collective captivity, again, not to be insulting to anybody, but over Germany, okay, during World War II. That they just got dominated by, by a thought process that allowed them to look the other way. And it's not just them, right? There's plenty of other examples that we could use, but that's, you know, that, that happens to just strike right at the heart of anti-Semitism and, and the way the Jews have been persecuted all these years, even by Christians. You know that, right? Christians have been some of the most severe persecutor of the Jews over the years. If you go to that uh, Holocaust Museum in, in Israel, it's stunning what the church has done to the Jews over the years. Not now, right? Thank God. America's doing a great job. A big part of the church is, but Whatever, it's a spirit, right? It's collective captivity. Demons desire to dominate people's thinking process and the society or subculture in a modern multicultural society. Now think about that, that's us. There aren't a lot of modern multicultural societies that are free like America, right? You can pick apart the mistakes, but nobody else has ever tried such an experiment like this. And, you know, we work with some of these people in the community here that, that immigrated here from South America. They didn't know the language, and they got here. Now they're driving their own car. They own their own business. And the one guy was talking, he's like, oh, man, America's a great country. I don't have to work for anybody. I can have my own business. 
And he's, yeah, that's exactly right. It's amazing, the opportunities that you, that you get here. And he's like, I know what it was like back home. I'm not going back. This is where I want to be because I have an opportunity at least, right? So there'll be, there'll be groups of people at all levels and stages of the cycle. Nevertheless, the demonic strategy, what, is to raise the level of captivity and keep people locked into evil domination. I know this is kind of heavy medicine. I don't see a lot of smiles looking back at me right now. But I'm trying to awaken you to say we can make a difference. Because the cycle starts to deteriorate when you get to like 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. It starts to lose some of its impact. And, and the collective captivity starts to shift. And now it's got to be to the next new thing. But because you just went around the cycle once, you have less resistance and you're more likely to be led down the next rabbit trail or the next lie, the next counterfeit thing that the enemy wants to give you. And I'm saying all of this off of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, to say that we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, including the power to navigate this mess that we're being offered and not only not be impacted by it, but to be the truth in the midst of the mess, to minister in the opposite spirit of what the world is doing, Shaming people today, if, if you said one bad thing or you had a wrong tweet or whatever, getting terminated. I mean, literally, tenured professors are getting fired, which is the whole idea of tenure, was, was to be able to protect you to have free speech so you wouldn't get fired. Unbelievable what's happening, but there, there's a bully spirit that's, that's getting some of this collective captivity traits to it. we got to take a stand. Amen? Amen. I'm almost done. Because we went around that whole cycle, really. I'm, I'm going to just finish with these couple of verses. And, and what's the reason I'm doing this? Is not to have like an encyclopedia up here. It's to say, how can these truths about what's going on and the truth of the word and the truth of the power that's already in us, really, do you need anything else than what you already have? We're not waiting on the next thing. We have the word. We have the spirit. Now it's just going to be a level of how much we're willing to apply it and how serious we're willing to take this and not just think of Christianity as, oh, well, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven when I die, and I can't lose my salvation. He's not an Indian giver, so as long as I get into heaven, I'm good. Well, you're falling way short of what you could be doing. If that's your mindset, no. As the Father sent me, Jesus said, so I send you. If, if Jesus is here, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil, not hide in the bunker and hope Jesus comes back. I, I came here to destroy the works of the devil. And if I did that and I'm sending you, you're going to do that too. And you should be smiling about that. Little old me, I could cast a demon out of somebody. Yeah, you could raise the dead. You'll lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. I, this is what believers do. These signs shall accompany those that believe in my name. But we got to start stepping out, right? And I love this. It says, those who huddle in the night. This is Luke 1, right? So Luke 1 goes through the whole kind of birthing of, of Jesus and, and, and all this amazing prophecy that's spoken over what this life is going to be. Those who huddle in the night, those who sit in the shadow of death will be able to rise and walk in the light, guided in the pathway of peace. So the people that are in collective captivity, the, the answer for that, the medicine for that is the church. It's the word of God. It's the truth in the midst of the lies. But it's also the living people that have the living spirit inside them willing to let that living spirit out. <laughs> Can we stand? I've only got a couple more verses, but I want you to try to think about how I can make an impact, right? How can I make an impact in, in my family, on my job, and the people that I associate with and whatever friend group I'm in? I was, you know, when I was in New York City um, working more actively on Wall Street, there was a, a group, I was, I was a member of, a, of this society called the CFA Society, which was, you know, very, like, uh, analytical analysts on Wall Street. I'm telling you, I had so many chances to witness the people there because... They, they got good grades. They went to great schools. They made good money, but they weren't satisfied with their life. And I would always end up leading the meetings because I had done so many meetings that they didn't know about, church meetings, but it's not that much different to run, run a business meeting. And they'd be like, what is it? Like, how come you don't get rattled about this or that or the other thing? And that's an open door. And I guarantee you all have them. There's, there's some that you're walking past where you get your coffee in the morning. Talk to that person. Talk to that, that, that lady or that man who's ever behind the counter there. Because you're this. Guided in the pathway of peace. 
the, the ones who sit in the shadow of death will be able to rise and walk in the light guided in the pathway of peace. This is simple. If we're willing to walk in that power, you will receive power to do this when you ask him for it. And then Luke says this. You know it. It's a quoting Isaiah. He sent me to tell those who are held captive that they can be set free and to tell the blind that they can now see. He sent me to liberate those held by oppression. And in short, the Spirit is upon me to proclaim, come on. Thank you. You get a gold star. How about saying it this way? Now is the time. Now is the time. What are we waiting for? Tomorrow going to be better than today? No. Time's wasted. Let's get started. Let's start exercising those muscles. And then once that momentum starts building, and then we get a collective faith, and then we get collective healings, and then we get collective miracles, and then you see yourself being used in a way, you don't ever want to go back to passive Christianity again. I sure don't. This is the jubilee season of the eternal one's grace. Last one. His breath filled all things with a living, breathing light, a light that thrives in the depths of darkness. <laughs> You thrive in the depth of darkness. I thrive in the depth of darkness. The, the mammon spirit over Wall Street is nothing compared to the light of God. There's all kinds of Christians over there that are, that are infiltrating and helping people realize more money ain't the answer. And you know, when you made all the money and you're still not happy, then you're really mad. Because I got worked 90 hours a week for the last 20 years. I thought that was going to make me happy. And then you convince them, try to give some of the money away and watch how much happier you'll be when, you, when, you, when you're generous. And you bring your kids with you, and they see what it's like to benefit and bless other people that, that you thought you were better than. Woohoo! Collective captivity is just lifting off. What, what a force we could be in the culture, man. It's amazing. Blazes through the murky bottoms. This light just blazes through the murky bottoms. It cannot be quenched. When it's the daytime, this is Jesus talking, so I should have put it in red letters, right? While it's the daytime, we must do the works of the one who sent me. But when the sun sets and night falls, this work is impossible. And that's how I pictured it in the dungeon. When I'm caught up in that collective captivity, when, when I'm numb to, to the real purpose of my life, the sun is setting and I can't work in the darkness. And Jesus is saying, no, whenever I'm in the world, then I am the light of that world. So I just saw this every day for us, right? It's not, you, you know, if, if he's in you, you're the light. That's something to get bragging about. That's just saying, he's in me. He wants to shine through me. Amen? So can you lift your hands? Can we make that our prayer? And if anybody wants prayer at the altar, please come forward. We, we want to just lay hands. We said it on Sunday. If you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit and you want to speak in tongues, let's step out in faith and believe God. When, when we lay hands on them, they, they started speaking in tongues. And, and they were shocked, some of the apostles. But these are unbelievers the same thing that happened to us happened to them. They're Gentiles. We didn't want them in the kingdom. Didn't matter. God did. And, and they started speaking in tongues. Amen? So whenever I'm in the world, Lord, we just say we want to be in the world. Not of the world, but in the world. We want to be about the business of the Father. And we want that power that we read about in Acts 1.8. Not just to go out and witness to people in that traditional sense, but that, that the light in us would just shine so brightly that others would be drawn to the you that they see in us. Not drawn to me, but drawn to you in the light that, that you reflect through my life. And whatever's stopping that, Lord, we ask you to get it out of our lives. We're willing to let you turn up the fire and turn up the heat to burn out any things that are dross, whatever, whatever things are in there that don't need to be there. Lord, we ask you to lift them off so that your power could be demonstrated to a greater level in Jesus' name. Amen.